module four, communication. One of the best assets an official can have on the ice, which often separates the good officials from the great officials, is their ability to communicate and deal with conflict. How an official handles themselves in stressful situations can turn a good game bad or bad game good at all levels. Here's what we will be looking at in this communication module. Some keys to communication. As an official, expect that at some point in your career, you will have to deal with conflict. Remember that the rulebook provides you the best tools to deal with coaches and players and understand how or why there's conflict is a, a good step to resolving it. Well, communication with players during the game is important as far as player safety and standard of play go. Opening up those lines of communication can prove valuable later in the game. It is important to understand that while trying to establish rapport, officials must re remain professional, but understand when it is appropriate to communicate in a joking and lighter manner is essential. Officials can appreciate good and excite, exciting hockey plays in a way that doesn't show favoritism and help take them beyond the stripes and the whistle. Through it all, remember officials must be viewed as professional at all levels, who are impartial and nonpartisan. Some communication tools. So understand that as an official, our actions create reactions. Um, and so some other things to consider. Body language. There you can see how uh, good body long language or poor body language um, can help with communication. The voice um, or tone or the volume that is used. Whistle, um, so you can effectively use an extra whistle um, to stop scrums or, or plays around the net. Uh, don't overuse this tool, but it is, a, is an option to help diffuse situations. Understand that players, coaches and fans perception is their reality. Learning to listen is one of the most valuable and respectful communication skills an official can acquire. When having conversations, use feedback techniques so that others know they are being heard. In our everyday lives, we communicate with many people and each person has a uni unique way of expressing and communicating their message. Understanding that different personalities require different communication attributes. So some of those are action. Uh, these type of people uh, often respond better with effective, efficient, result-oriented, quick communication. Then we have process communication. People with this communication style need to understand the why, how it compares, and if th there is control. And then there's the people, uh, type of communication. These are the people who care about the team and the people and the feelings involved and communicate more with uh, I feel or I like mentality. And then the last one is idea. These types of personalities often need time for discussion and need to understand the how and the process. So now we're going to watch the communication video. Um, which has some, some great pointers for all officials. Today we're going to talk about the many facets of communication and how it helps us become successful officials. Communication for us as officials takes on many elements and relationships. We have communication with coaches and assistant coaches. We also have to be able to talk to the players and communicating with our own teammates is perhaps one of the most important and most overlooked elements of good communication. Communication really begins as soon as we enter a building and much of that communication is nonverbal. Are we dressed appropriately? Do we have good body language and present ourselves in a respectful and confident manner? Once you're on the ice, a large part of a communication is through signals and body language. So it's important that we work on these skills as well. Our comportment and how we talk and interact with participants in the game is of great significance in how we are perceived, how we build respect and how we're able to manage and control the game. Let's get some thoughts and video examples from our partners. I think you have to be a good communicator. Uh, it shows that you're human. It also shows that you 
uh, command respect, um, but at the same time you will be respectful of teams and coaches. Um, if you can communicate with teams and coaches, then um, you know it, it, it develops relationships, it develops rapport, and it only helps you down the road because you might have to use that communication tool that you have to diffuse a situation at a later date. I think communication is important because you have to be able to get along with the other participants in the game to show that you're uh, in charge but also to show that you're not um, unreasonable and that you can't uh, ask a question, they can't ask you a question without you uh, throwing the rules right down their throat. You have to be able to establish a rapport and uh, give and take is important. You know, you don't ever want your first conversation with with a coach, most importantly, and, and often with a player to to you know be um, to be getting mad at them for something. So I always like to open up communication with a coach, whether it be saying hello to them, how's it going, how's the road trip going, and at least then you start off the night with uh, being a human and having some rapport before you're having to talk to them about a. Uh, you know, a long line change or too many men or something where all of a sudden you're, you're giving feedback in a negative way. If you, if you listen with some empathy with them, and sometimes it's hard, but if you understand them, you can usually get to their level a little bit and calm them down. They need to know the people they're dealing with in order to best communicate with them and know what works for that approach. So things with coaches, I think what everybody expects and demands, our game demands it, is honesty and integrity. And as if you can communicate well, and, and in, in amongst teams too, even, even the officials, if you can communicate well, um, I believe that's the component that when things do maybe go wrong, you can you can talk to someone, you can work it out. They they feel they've been heard, and they can go on. So I think you know the biggest thing is to, to have that eye contact. If if it's a minor thing, sometimes you can have that conversation without anyone else in the building knowing. Uh, you don't have to be facing them. Just say, listen, I hear you. You can be looking at the play or looking at the face off maybe, and and talking, uh, and you get that same point across. Uh, communication in the game. Um, it's not on, on, you know, when you do, uh, you know, good announcements for penalties or having to talk to a coach. A lot of times you can control the game just between the whistles of short, positive communication with players, reminders of keeping your, you know, keep your your, your elbows down. That's, that, you know, that was riding up there. Hard on you, like if it's up, like, I mean, your mid section, like, call it, but it's all on your pad there, right? So you got a little pad in there, but we're good, we're good. You don't, you don't manage player safety. What you do is you tell the player when you give him the you give him the penalty like that, you just go, Do you want to get hit like that? Or a lot of times that's very effective with a coach. You go, Do you want right. your player hit like that? The, the original hook, and then we got them for a charge and the late hit on the half wall to win. If you can communicate of uh, kind of why you're calling it and use different verbiage that you know supports your call. It goes a long ways, and if play, you know what? And it's not there's no there's nothing wrong with going. Hey, I didn't see it, you know, like because coaches, even though they you know they'll probably be mad at you, but but they can accept a missed call rather than a guess. I had this guy jumping early. I had him jumping early out out of the gate here. Yeah, but that's a defenseman change for a defenseman. Well, I got a guy here and a guy on the bench. Right? Fair enough. If that's the case, then I apologize. When they hear positives. These players, you know, they, they look at you like, really? And then you go, and then they become, they'll communicate with you. So they come up, start of the game, they see you, they come up, then they say hi or tap you on the pads. And I just go, hey, we're going to be fair tonight. Fine, are you doing the forwards for the most part? Are you doing the forwards? Okay. Puck's there. Here, guys, here. Own guy, own guy. From a linesman's perspective, uh, our job is more of a, um, uh, we actually have to calm things down a little bit more. The aggression is uh, usually between the coach, uh, the players, and the referee. Um, and as officials, as linesmen, we're you know more in charge of the flow of the game. Um, and I think it really helps and it benefit, benefits everybody involved. Uh, as a linesman, if you have a good demeanor, you're calm, um, you can kind of put some fires out. Uh, you have to, instead of elevating the instead of elevating the aspect of the heat of the moment, um, you try to really uh, work towards making sure that everything's uh, um, calmed, uh, everything is seen in uh, a different light, 
and you can kind of alleviate a little bit of uh, frustration from time to time. I think that you know, was a real tribute uh, or a real attribute uh, of, a, of a linesman. Linesman can be a great buffer between the referees and the coaches and the benches and uh, we can get in the players ears and talk to them and kind of de-escalation is the key. Um, everyone's always hot and worked up a lot of the time when we need to intervene and um, if you have good de-escalation techniques you can bring the temperature of the game down and uh, be able to work through situations with the game participants better. We as lines would have a pretty unique opportunity and, and, and role where we can kind of play the, the good cop to the bad cop. Um, you know, if you reference the referee as being the bad cop, but we can kind of have a different relationship where the players where we can not, not um, you know, totally disregard with what, what the referees are doing, but kind of play the other side of, of bringing the players down and, and diffusing the situation, maybe taking some heat off the referees as well. Same, same thing with coaches. Uh, we, we have that opportunity to be sort of a sounding board for the, for the coaches to say what they have to say and without having to get the referees involved in, and they can vent. And obviously there's, there's lines that get crossed and we, we, have, to, we have to accept that things, things that are said aren't, uh, aren't always appropriate and we have to deal with it uh, appropriately. What's that? I straight off his shoulder. Yeah. Just con it just concerned if he bumped uh, bumped the goalie going behind, but he he was clear. So they were looking to see if it was glove though. There's other subtle forms of communication too. Posturing can be a very important part of how you communicate with people. Someone's sense, whether it's a coach who's on the bench or a player who's on the ice and you're having a face-to-face -face conversation, um, it's not only the words that you're using, but the tone in which you communicate in or the, or the body language that you use. Between officials, I think communication is probably our biggest asset we can have. Um, we're a team just like the two teams were working so the more uh, we're in tune with each other uh, we, you might not agree with everything that your teammates have to say but at least if you're communicating and open to communication between the teammates um, it kind of gives you a sense of direction on how that game needs to be officiated managed um, able to put out hot spots if need be or to sit back and let the game evolve if, if that's what that game requires. So I think it's important that we stay together as a team uh, and keep those communication lines open. I think communication with partners is, is key. I know for us um, now at the professional level we, we discuss a lot, even starts at lunchtime. Uh, we talk about game participants, things that happened previous games. Um, just even unique situations that we've had that have come up and that might come up. So I think it just prepares you uh, for situations that may occur or may not. I think we'd all rather come into a game and be over-prepared than under-prepared. Just having those discussions and building a relationship with your partner, a trusting relationship and making sure that both of you are on the same page or all of the officials are on the same page. So knowing different situations, how we're going to interact, how we're going to communicate and how decisions are going to be made on the ice. We don't have a lot of time to do that during the play or on the ice. So before the game, pre-game, it's vital that those conversations happen. So I talked to uh, 26 from Lethbridge and that scrum down there. Next time I'm going to take you. He, he, come, he, he just stays there oh, and okay, grabs a Calgary D-man and keeps pushing him in towards the net. So just doesn't leave. Great examples of some great communication. Communication is key for us. What it does is it provides personality. It provides the opportunity that we go over to a bench that we have a relationship with. And we have to work through hard times. The foundation we've built through our communication will allow us and the participants to get through those situations. Our personality and our communication are key elements in officiating. Dealing with conflict. Regardless of whether you're a first year minor hockey official or a 15 year NHL official, you will run into conflicts and it is important to know how to manage and resolve the conflicts. The first thing to understand is that when conflict arises, it is not necessarily the official's fault. 
Players, coaches, and fans often look for something or someone else to blame when the game isn't going their way, and officials seem to the, be the easiest scapegoat. One of the biggest parts of an official's job is conflict management. He will not make calls that please both teams, but the goal should be to earn everyone's respect. And one other thing when dealing with conflict, remember the Q-tip approach, which stands for quit taking it personally. Officials must understand that not all conflict has to be negative, as long as both sides are respectful and understand how to manage conflict. The key is to understand when and why conflict occurs in games and being comfortable with the strategies and communication skills that can help diffuse the conflict. So what is conflict? Conflict refers to some sort a friction or discord arising within a group or two people who have a power struggle or strong disagreement with opposing opinions or principles. Conflict often occurs when someone often feels wronged or taken advantage of. So this can happen because of a fast paced game with a raised level of effort and emotion. Officials are tasked with calling the game based on the discretion and interpretation of the rules. So this can be you know, waving off goals, calls or non-calls throughout the game, uh, close lines person calls, player safety concerns. Players, team officials and spectators may disagree or not understand the decisions made throughout the game. And this is a point where uh, we may have to explain situations and, and calls or non-calls throughout the game to the participants. Hockey Canada has a focus on this shared respect and you can see there it's for players, coaches, officials, parents, uh, basically everyone involved in the game. Um, and this, the points of this shared respect platform are, I understand the safety of the participants in the game is more important than the final score. I value the contribution of the coach in developing the players talents even though I may not always agree with their methods. I understand that officials do not make the rules, they only apply them. I understand that children learn from adults and my behavior reflects what I want children to learn. So as senior experienced officials, that's a, a key point there. I understand that officials are responsible to ensure that the game is played in a safe and fair manner. I understand that players, coaches, and officials are learning the game and mistakes will be made in the learning process. I may not cheer for the opposition, but I will not cheer against them or verbally abuse them. I understand that the biggest reason for players and officials quitting the game is abuse, or one of the biggest reasons anyways. Shared respect. Um, so just uh, kind of a, a poster or a, a motto from Hockey Canada that I'm sure many of you have seen before um, and, and something we really want to get out to all participants and we'll have a little bit more information on the maltreatment side uh, later on in these modules. Remember it's about fairness and respect, it's about play, it's about family, it's about us all having fun and being kids. The best way to teach respect is to show respect. When a child experiences respect, they know what it feels like and begin to understand how important it is. Abuse and harassment. It is important that all officials put themselves in a position to be safe in both hockey uh, on and off the ice. Understand the progression from a warning to an unsportsmanlike or a bench minor to a mis misconduct, game misconduct or gross misconduct is important to help officials deal with abusive participants in the game. Officials will be supported when they follow the proper process. And again, we've got uh, more on this um, with the, the new Hockey Canada maltreatment. Disagreeing or arguing a call. So whistle, use a second or third whistle. Do not overuse this option as we mentioned before so it doesn't lose the impact with participants. Make sure everyone can hear the warning. Verbal, speak loudly with an authoritative yet calm and respectful voice. That's enough. Stop, we're done now. Next one's going. No more. Um, those are some examples. Physical. 
Uh, so again, we can have that presence, get our hands up, be big around the net, uh, avoid players for confrontation, issue warnings, um, and remember games will be emotional at times. Avoid antagonizing a player or, co or coach and always treat disrespect with respect. Challenging or disputing behavior. A minor penalty shall be assessed to any player or team official who challenges or disputes the ruling of any official during the game who displays unsportsmanlike conduct. Disputing behavior may include disrespectful language or someone who yells and swears. Remember, do not overreact and use warnings if or when it's necessary, but we don't want to give them too much of a leash um, and we, we really want to make sure that we are all officials are on the same page with this. Persistent or abusive behavior. A misconduct penalty shall be assessed to any player who uses obs obscene, profane or abusive language or gestures to any person or persists in disputing or shows disrespect for the ruling of an official or intentionally knocks or shoots the puck out of reach of an official who is retrieving it. Also, if a player or goaltender persists with unsportsmanlike conduct, they shall be assessed a misconduct penalty. A good guideline for whether an unsportsmanlike conduct minor penalty or misconduct penalty should be assessed is if the player is going out of their way to dispute a call or show disrespect, it should be penalized as a misconduct. Where obscene, abusive, or profane language is directed at the official, a misconduct penalty may be assessed without assessing the unsportsmanlike conduct minor penalty. If the player persists but does not go out of their way or create much conflict, an unsportsmanlike conduct minor penalty shall be assessed. So now just going to look at some examples and some scenarios. So uh, the first one, after a call, you see a coach doing the, the famous Don Cherry with her arms up in the, in the air from the bench. Um, and you can either avoid or respond to this. If you choose to avoid, do not this let this situation with the coach escalate. If you choose to respond, ask the coach to stop, answer the question or explain the call. If it continues after issuing a warning, assess a bench minor penalty. So the next one, after a big hit that you choose not to call a penalty uh, and the coach wants to talk. Again, you can either avoid or respond. If you choose to avoid, check with your partner to ensure you didn't miss something that could be called a major penalty. Um, and if you do choose to respond, talk to your coach, explain the facts of what you saw from your angle. If it continues, don't be afraid to draw the line and end the conversation. If the conversation escalates to a heated situation, you may, be, may assess a bench minor penalty. The next example, you assess a minor penalty for tripping. On the way to the penalty box, the player receiving the penalty challenges your call. You can either again avoid or respond. If you choose to avoid, ensure that the actions are not escalating to an aggressive or disrespectful level and create more distance between yourself and the player. If you choose to respond, again, treat disrespect with respect. Do not raise your emotions to the player's level and briefly explain the call. If it continues, assess a minor penalty for unsportsmanlike conduct to that player. Next one, you assess a penalty. On the way to the penalty box, a teammate of that player skates over to you and verbally disputes your call. Again, you can either avoid or respond. If you choose to avoid, ensure that the actions are not escalating to an aggressive or disrespectful level. If you choose to respond, treat disrespect with respect. Do not raise your emotions to that player's level. If it continues, assess a misconduct penalty to that player as to not penalize the team, but the individual for his actions or their actions for going out of their way to dispute this call. Again, that brings an end to this communication module. We have more on the maltreatment, the new focus from Hockey Canada coming up later on, but make sure to try and use many of these communication tips and understand the importance of good communication as an official. 
To advance, close this module, complete the knowledge check, and there should be a check mark beside the communication module. Select module five to continue. 